Hi, everyone. Welcome, bienvenides. My name is Jacqueline Flores. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I'm the producer for the Latinx Theater Commons. Tonight, we have Lavender Sunye and Selena Flowers from Pro Bono ASL who are providing ASL interpretation and National Captioning Institute is providing the live human written captions. If you would like to comment, there is a web chat next to the live video player. I am zooming in from the land of the Nakachetank, whose descendants belong to the Piscataway people, colonially known as Washington, D.C. Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show has created the following digital acknowledgement I'd like to share with you all. Since our discussion today is shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that dispro disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. The Latinx Theater Commons is a national movement that uses a commons-based approach to transform the narrative of the American theater, to amplify the visibility of Latinx performance making, and to champion equity through advocacy, art making, convening, and scholarship. It brings me great joy to host a conversation between the Diane 2022 and 2023 awardees moderated by Chantal Rodriguez with an introduction by Jose Delgado. The Diane Rodriguez Teatrista Award, known as the Diane, is a Latinx Theater Commons first award dedicated to an individual working in the theater field who is committed to increasing Latinx representation across disciplines. With this award, the LTC aims to continue the legacy of Diane Rodriguez, an award-winning multi-hyphenate theater artist who tirelessly advocated for other artists and opened doors for future leaders in the field. After studying theater at UC Santa Barbara, Diane became a leading actress for 10 seasons with the groundbreaking theater company El Teatro Campesino, the farm workers theater where Luis Valdez was founder and artistic director. Rodriguez also was a co-founder of the comedy troupe Latins Anonymous. She worked at Center Theater Group for 24 years as Associate Artistic Director at CTG. She oversaw the production of new plays and developed the work of more than 75 artists, playwrights, and companies. In recent years, she also wrote and directed plays centering strong Latinas. Rodriguez also wrote and consulted on scripts for Mattel's live Barbie productions, including Barbie Live, and she was a consultant on the animated Disney series Elena of Avalor about a Latina princess. The inaugural award recipient was unanimously selected in the summer of 2022 by a group of seven nominators, myself, Amelia Costa Powell, Anne Garcia Romero, Lisa Portes, Jose Luis Valenzuela, Abigail Vega, and Karen Zacarias. This year's awardee was selected from nominations made by peers and colleagues throughout the field. All the nominations were reviewed and the awardee was selected by an appointed committee. With this approach, we aim to amplify Diane's spirit of generosity and her commitment to empowering fellow artists throughout her remarkable career. Diane Rodriguez served on the LTC's advisory committee for six years. The 2023 Diane Selection Committee included inaugural recipient Patricia Garza, Diane's husband Jose Delgado, Chantal Rodriguez, Jackie Segui, and Eric Schwartz. Thank you so much to everyone who made a nomination and to the committee for their incredible work. Thank you also to those who have donated to the LTC. This award is made possible because of your support. The Diane is fully funded through our individual giving contributions. And if you'd like to make a donation, you can go um, to bit.ly slash support the LTC, which will also show up in the chat where you're watching this. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Jose Delgado, Diane's husband, who has been involved in the process since the idea was formed. And it's been an honor to get to know Diane more through your eyes. Jose has 50 years of experience in theater and artist management as a general manager 
tour manager, administrator, producer, and business manager. He was a member of El Teatro Campesino and currently sits on their board of directors. He was a he also served seven years on the Cornerstone Theater Company Board of Directors, six of those as a chair. He was a producing director of the Ohio Playwrights Conference for 10 years and has been on their board of directors since 2011. And as the owner of Play, Playaids Management, he manages Mariachi Sol de Mexico and Mariachi Reinas de Los Angeles. JD, thank you. Um. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. You make me sound ancient. <laughs> well, you know, I'm thrilled to have been part of the Diane Rodriguez Beatrista Award Selection Committee. And I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thank the Latinx Theater Commons for creating this award and for the time and dedication that it takes to raise the funds and tend to the matters of soliciting nominations, gathering information, scheduling Zoom meetings, etc. I have to say that the process was thorough and thoughtful. And Diane would have been thrilled to have been, to have seen the response from the field and the roster of nominees. They ranged from new artists, mid-career and legacy artists. And I know she knew a good number of the nominees and if she <clears throat> were still with us today, would have reached out to, to befriend the new faces. It may be happy to be introduced to a whole new generation of Latinx theater artists. The field is healthy and thriving. The committee members were very kind to me because I, um, and patient because I'd often digress and, and talk about uh, just little stories and anecdotes about Diane. And um, I might have digressed too much with stories about Diane and her career, but permit me to digress just a bit with a couple of other newer stories, which the committee members have not heard. Now, <clears throat> I've already given Patricia license to give me the signal to stop if I go on too long. Diane had a number of mentors in her career, and they included Professor Jorge Huerta, Luis Valdez, Philip Hemberg, director Lisa Peterson, uh, Olga Garay English, just to name a few. Professor Huerta introduced Diane to Luis and the Teatro Campesino. At the time, Jorge was a UC San, at UC Santa Barbara. And as a student, Diane was discouraged, actually, from pursuing a career in the theater by more than one of her professors. I'm sure that many of you might have gone through a similar experience. She applied to CalArts after graduating from UC Santa Barbara to go to the graduate school and knew that her other option was to join the Teatro, Teatro Campesino if she was not admitted. Well, she was not admitted and she joined the Teatro and remained a part of the company where she thrived. Years later, the School of Theater Arts at Cal Arts was conducting a search for a new dean. She was approached by a member of the search committee to know if she might be interested in applying. She respectfully declined. We did a lot of touring when we were in the teatro. We drove these two huge outfitted Dodge cargo vans and Diane learned to drive them like a champ. I'm sure many of you could never envision seeing Diane behind the wheel of a huge Dodge cargo van. But anyway, she would often say that driving those vans while on the road taught her how to be a leader especially when she was driving the lead van. And, you know, we take turns. It trained her, she said, to make sure that the second van was following close behind. If it didn't make a light, she would pull over and wait until it caught up. She learned that part of the responsibility of the leader is to make sure that the others were following. Now, these were her words, okay? Now, she would say that driving those vans also taught her how to be a follower which was equally as hard, but just as important. And that leadership was about knowing when to follow and when to lead. That the ultimate goal was to make sure that everyone was moving forward together. Diane was always a bit of an outsider. That's what she considered herself to be. And she reflected in a notebook uh, how this was true. And I'll, I'll end by quoting her, okay? 
For many years, I considered my greatest strength was due to the fact that I was an outsider working on the inside. I'm on the artistic staff of one of the largest theaters in the country. And I like not being part of the status quo. I basked in it. And then I became president of the TCG board, which is the largest service organization for professional theaters in the country. And then the White House called one day in May of 2014. They called with the idea of a nomination from President Obama to the National Council of the Arts. It took eight months to be vetted. The years as an outsider came to an end when the nomination was announced on January 10th, 2015. Now, I have to admit, I kind of mourned the loss. It's cool being a renegade to be under the raid radar. It was comfortable. And you know, it's easy being comfortable than having to actually redirect yourself, right? Change is hard. And I had to open the window to my crazy mind and let the Pacific air flow through. The most comforting idea to me is that you will never be alone if you take care of your family, your community, your land. When your children move away, after all, and have children of their own, you will not be alone. The community you give to will give back, and the generosity of spirit with which you lead, led your life will fulfill you throughout. It's now my great pleasure to, to uh, introduce this little clip, which the committee has selected uh, from a group that Diane was one of the co-founders of Latins Anonymous, as was described earlier by Jacqueline. And um, just to give you, to contextualize it just a little bit, um, this original ensemble, which was made up of uh, Luisa Lechen, Rick Nakeda, and Armando Molina, um, met each other actually at a, a, a cattle call audition. And um, so they they started talking and they realized that, you know, they're, they're, that they were all fighting the same struggle. They were all being called up for the same stereotype, typical roles. This is in like the, the late 80s. And uh, so they got this group together. Uh, Luis Lachin, uh was always working, but she was an aspiring TV writer. She's now a showrunner, uh, I believe, for Netflix and some some Netflix some of the uh, um, network shows. Um, Rick Nachera is a producer, and uh, he's done quite well for himself. Armando Molina uh, runs as the artistic director for Company of Angels, and then of course there was Diane. That was the original class. Um, but this clip is um, uh, was something that they did. Uh, it's it's uh, well maybe about. 15 years ago, no, 20 years ago. And it may not include Rick. Um, uh, it may include um, Chris Franco uh, in uh, Rick Nakata's place because Rick went off after about four or five years. And uh, Chris, who's now a com comedy writer, uh, may have been in this role. So let's take it away. Okay, guys, it's almost showtime, the La 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 Awards. Do we have to have a meeting now? Yes, yes. we do. Uh, my name's Armando. Hi, Hi, Armando. And I admit I'm a Latin. Hi, my name is Diane. Hi, Hi Diane. Diane. And I'm a recovering Chicana. Hi, I'm Chris Franco. Chris, it's anonymous. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Chris, and I admit I'm a sensitive man trapped in a macho body. Nicolette? Right. Oh, no, 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 no. I am no longer Nicolette Sauvignon Blanc. From now on, you can call me Luisa Josefina Gomez. The program really works. All right. That's fantastic. Okay, breakthrough. Time. All right. I'm in. Okay, so this is the program. Yeah. Okay, so this is the program. All right, we did it. A short beat watching hard copy. It's the only family entertainment we could afford. Yes, we looted. We saw todo el mundo playing supermarket sweep, I, and I worked 27 hours a day. We deserve a break today. So I broke a window. I rented a van. I leased a store lot, cleared an entire Levitt's warehouse. I loved it at Levitt. We had a ball. It was the best day of my rotten life. Los Angeles, will you ever forgive us? Gente, there you have it. The decadent sexual practices that caused the L.A. riots. Take them away. Please welcome a woman whose lips know no rest, the irrepressible Churro. La, 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 a wasp. I mean, a wasp by a million, a million of English. 
English and a Spanish-speaking person. So imagine, I am being misunderstood by both two languages. Ay, 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 ay. No, really. It is a wonderful thing to be bilingue. So many people ask me, churro, churro. Why is it that Latinos can't lose their accent? Well, for one, I wouldn't have a career, huh? No, really, it is so important to be bilingue and to talk in two languages. Even President Bush has spoke a double talk. And look what happened to him, huh? Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for those words and for introducing that uh, wonderful and hilarious clip. Um, I won't keep you all waiting much longer to meet our awardees. Today's conversation is moderated by Chantal Rodriguez, who is a mentee of Diane's and served on this year's selection committee. Chantal Rodriguez is the Associate Dean of the David Geffen School of Drama and Associate Artistic Director of Yale Repertory Theater. She is also an associate professor adjunct in dramaturgy and dramatic criticism. Prior to joining the Yale community in 2016, she was a programming director and literary manager of the Latino Theater Company, operators of the Los Angeles Theater Center, a multi-theater complex in downtown LA. At the LATC, she helped produce many seasons of culturally diverse work, including the historic Encuentro 2014 Festival. She is a member of the Latinx Theater Commons Advisory Committee and the National Advisory Board for the 50 Playwrights Project. Chantal is a graduate of UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, where she earned a PhD in Theater and Performance Studies in Santa Clara University, where she earned a BA in Theater and Spanish Studies. Chantal. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I, it's really an honor to be here uh, virtually with everyone and honoring the great um, Mera Mera, Diane Rodriguez. Um, I want to give my thanks to HowlRound, to the Latinx Theater Commons, and in particular to our guests tonight, our two awardees, who I'll introduce in just a moment. And also just want to give a big shout out and a lot of thanks and love to JD. It's been an honor and a pleasure to spend time with you in, in this committee. Um, and so uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce you to our awardee. Um, the 2022 awardee is Patricia Garza. They use they, them pronouns. They are the producer and director of programs at Los Angeles Performance Practice, supporting the production and presentation of contemporary performance. Prior to joining LAPP, they served as director of programs and engagement at the Network of Ensemble Theaters. A former member of the artistic staff at Center Theater Group for over a decade, Patricia filled roles spanning artistic and new play development, education, and community engagement and partnerships and programming. They had the honor of working alongside Diane for over six years, and together they engaged world-renowned international and local companies on multi-year projects focused on collective and ensemble creation. Patricia also works passionately with other creative professionals nationally on issues surrounding anti-racism and collective liberation. They have an MFA and MBA in theater management from Cal State Long Beach and a BA in English with a minor in theater studies from UC Berkeley. And so I invite you to join me in welcoming Patricia to the virtual stage. And I'm going to introduce the 2023 awardee, Adriana Gaviria. Adriana is an actress, voiceover artist, writer, director, advocate, and creative producer. She is founding member and co-artistic producer of The Soul Project and lead producer for Soul Fest. She serves on the advisory boards of 50 Playwrights Project and Florida International University Theater Alumni, the executive team of Parent Artist Advocacy League, and she's on the steering committee for the Latinx Theater Commons. Adriana has performed as an actor at regional theaters across the nation, and she's also appeared in a variety of commercials as well as television and film. She is an award-winning artist um, who received her BFA from Florida International University and her MFA from the Yale School of Drama, which makes me doubly excited to welcome her to the virtual stage. Please join us. Welcome. Welcome, 
Patricia and Adriana. It's such a joy to be with here moderating this conversation between the two of you. Um, I'm personally friends with you both, and it makes me really thrilled um, to share space and to just have this rich conversation today. Um, it's so wonderful to celebrate Diane's uh, legacy and spirit today, and the award is such a great way to honor um, her legacy and ongoing legacy in our field. So first, I would just love to invite you, can you each share a little bit about what being a recipient of the Diane means to you? Um, and maybe, um, Patricia, we can start with you since you're the inaugural recipient. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Chantal, for that wonderful introduction and JD for really framing uh, our Diane's uh, legacy and Jacqueline for uh, the bio that can never be long enough. I mean, my Diane did it all. Um, Y'all, this is so exciting. Uh, just congratulations to Adriana. And I'm so honored to share space with you and Chantal, a good friend of mine today. And I think for me, um, I'll just tell a funny story. Uh, so Karen Zacarias tried to get a hold of me for like weeks <laughs> to tell me about this award. And I kept me like, ah, like voicemail because I was sick with COVID at the time. Um, and so thank you, Karen, for your tenacity. Um, but when I heard, I was literally like in my PJs, like covered <laughs> with day cool. And I really didn't believe it, you know, because... Um, JD doesn't really keep secrets from me, and I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> so I was pretty surprised. We had been talking about a legacy award for Diane for a number, you know, since she passed, we were like, we need to do something. The community needs to come together. We need to honor her legacy. And, you know, just for whatever reason, and never nothing really stuck um, through our conversations. And so the fact that this all happened and I didn't know about it and I was surprised by it, it just meant so much to me. I think I probably wept <laughs> um, from the medicine and also from the shock, but also just uh, Diane was a dear friend, a colleague, um, an inspiration, a mentor. Um, and so for me to even be associated with her legacy in any way just meant so much to me personally as, as a theater professional, as a performance maker, but also as a friend. Um, you know, I think, you know, as we were moving through her, her life, you know, towards the end of her life, um, she just had these really moments of clarity and she would like shout out orders to me. <laughs> like things she wanted to get done still um she's like don't forget to do this and uh, look into this um because that's how diane is you know always looking towards the future always looking towards um you know the legacy of her community and so i just really felt inspired to continue that work um before the award and then now particularly after the award really thinking about what does it mean to have to be the Diane awardee and what does it mean to carry forward her legacy in all things? And so I'm constantly evoking her. I'm constantly asking her for support and guidance in my life. Um, and she's, she's here. This is her, <laughs> her photo though is here. And I have her on my, in my altar and, um, and I just uh, feel like her presence is always going to be with me. And now to see it being shared with a larger community just means uh, even more to me. So but I'll pass to Adriana. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Patricia. And thank you, Chantal, uh, JD, and um, LTC. I, I think, Patricia, I think you started a trend uh, because... <laughs> Because I was also, it was in the morning too, and uh, not, you know, right, like not ready. Um, also caught by surprise. And when Jacqueline and Chantal told me, definitely ugly cry, ugly cry, and completely in shock. And also um, so meaningful on top of that, because um, because it was from Chantal and, and, and Jacqueline, who was uh, relaying that information. Uh, and uh, and just to be. Um, yes, I, I, I was it was it was a huge um, it was a huge moment. It meant a lot to me. You know, Diane, I, I did not have um, uh, the fortune of working with her um, as long as you you did uh, or or knowing her as long as you did um but the moments and the interactions that I did have with her really really um 
motivated me to be a better artist, to be a better person, um, really inspired me. I was so in awe of everything that she did. And she was such a, a close friend um, to a lot of people that are really close to me. So that's like, you know, it's familia. Um, and it was, um, it wasn't, it still is uh, very special. And sometimes I, I, it's unbelievable, right? Um, because sometimes you, you know, you you do stuff and you don't know if it's making an impact or a difference. Um, and when I would see Diane, I would see what, you know, what a difference she was making and what an impact she was making. And I just looked up to her so much. Um, and I, I was, I was just in awe of, of Diane. So it meant a lot to me. It means a lot to me. Thank you both. Yes, I can attest that, you know, we surprised Adriana, we had to find, we concocted a reason why we needed to talk to her. Um, so we could, so we could surprise her with the information, but it was so joyful. And in fact, this whole process of being on the selection committee has been so joyful. And we'd like to um, continue the tradition where the awardee then serves on the, the committee the following year. Um, and it's just such a way of connecting the dots, as Adriana mentioned, even if someone didn't know Diane directly or work with her directly, sort of the degree of separation was probably like one person in terms of, you know, the impact that she had in the field and not just within Latine, Latinx theater, right? She was a force in the American theater and also on the global stage. Um, and as a presenter, producer, I mean, she was so committed to such an expansive understanding of the arts and such a rigorous approach um, to art making. Um, that it's only fitting that two artists and um, and administrators and multi hyphenate folks such as yourselves are are the first two recipients. Um, and so one of the things that Diane was so uh, passionate about, as she was a really like a staunch advocate, right, for equity and inclusion, wanting to make sure that our spaces, you know, she she really broke barriers and then held the door open for those of us coming behind, right? And she like, you know, cracked open a window for folks to climb it. I mean, she was always about trying to support folks um, in not only getting into organizations and and but changing them, right? To be a better, more inclusive um, uh, spaces to make really rigorous and risk-taking art. So I'd love to know, um, you know, I know that both of you have dedicated your careers to advocating for artists in various ways. Um, and for instance, Adriana, one of the, the things that was so impressive about the nominations for you was not only your advocacy in the for the Latina theater artists, but specifically for parents, right, working with PAL. And so I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what advocacy means to you in the field and how you see your work in a continuum that's not only connected to Diane's legacy, but, um, but to those um, artist activists that have come before. Yes, definitely. Uh, I always go back to, and I will say this for the rest of my life, that the 2014 Encuentro for me was life-changing. That's where I met Diane. That's where I met Chantal. Um, probably where I met Pat uh, Patricia. Um, I met so many people um, during, during Encuentro. And it made me um, think of things very differently. Um, up to that point, I had I had done the typical, not the typical, but uh, a usual trajectory where you go to graduate school. Um, I, I graduated as a performer. Uh, you audition for roles. There's not enough roles. You're frustrated, um, and you and and that's what I was doing, right? I was auditioning for roles, um, and for me, the encuentro allowed me to see other theater makers who were multi-hyphenated right who were doing their own material who was who were changing things who were uh, doing a lot of advocacy um and that uh and at the same time balancing work uh their work life right um having a work-life balance um which is something that i've always aspired to so when i saw it firsthand as an example i was like this is this is amazing um, and so that that's that's what started everything for me. I, I went back to New York uh, with that fire in me to not to to really uh, own the responsibility that I had as as an artist to make things better, um, to uh, create change. Um, and that's when 
uh, and David was another uh, artistic fellow at, at the Encuentro. Uh, so David introduced me to Jacob and that started those conversations with the Soul Project around that time. Um, again, it was this whole family work balancing both. That was always um, something that was a, a huge interest um, for me. And uh, a couple years later, uh, I met Rachel, uh, who was also feeling similar um, struggles. Um, and we started partnering. And we started, I mean, she was doing her thing. There were a couple of um, groups that were doing things overseas that I was also inspired about in Ireland and um, in London, um, who were really addressing the issues that artists were having, you know, trying to uh, balance uh, both having your family and also having a career. And uh, so we started little by little, just having panels and going to having just opening the conversation, uh, doing things virtually. It's it's a passion that I have talking about that, especially um fertility and reproductive um, care, parent artists, caregivers. So not only um, parents, but also uh, as you take care of your of your aging relatives and aging family members, I think that that um, all needs uh, support as as you go through this, you know, as you go through your career, uh, which has not been present in the past. And so uh, all of this started uh, because of Encuentro, because I, I felt a responsibility as an artist to make things better. And um, and specifically, Diane, just seeing her do all these things in many capacities. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And and I just want to shout out um, Jose Luis Valenzuela, the artistic director of the Latino Theater Company, um, who runs the LATC. Um, and... Um, I'm really proud that we're doing this today as well when they've just announced that the Latino Theater Company is working on, you know, supporting a multi-million dollar granting uh, award for um, for Latino theater companies. Um, and so I see sort of, you know, I see Diane's legacy in her contemporaries um, and and in folks and leaders um, that have these shared values. Um, and another leader I think of um, when I think of Patricia and our time together is also Carmen Morgan, the amazing um, um, arts advocate, community organizer, and just brilliant mind. And um, Patricia, I know you've done a lot of work with art equity as an example and sort of anti-racism work. And I wondered if you could speak about that advocacy work in the field and how you see it connected to um, your work with Diane. I know that together at Center Theater Group, for example, the two of you were really working to make change um, and I'd just love to hear how, how you've taken sort of that um, inspiration and that collaboration with Diane and, and out into all of your different um, roles in the field now. Yeah, I, first I just want to uplift what Adrian is saying about um, parent, guardian, caretaker support is just so needed in our field. There's not enough people funding it. There's not enough people building programming to, you know, accommodate um, so that's just something I'm super passionate about and something that I'm really putting in some practices at my current organization that's building off the legacy of the founder there, Miranda Wright, um, because, you know, we have so many incredible artists that have left the field, you know, because they're, we're not making space for them. So anyway, I just wanted to applaud that work and, and lift that up. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been so blessed, you know, Diane, uh, Diane is uh, instrumental in all of my <laughs> major decisions, as long with a, a couple other key mentors from Center Theater Group, Leslie Johnson, um, you know, who really uh, advocated me uh, for me in education and community partnerships. And then I moved over to Diane, uh, with, to work with Diane. And uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's a surprise that CTG is a predominantly white institution, um, still is. And I think, uh, you know, when you move through those spaces, you look for those <laughs> friends, <laughs> you look for those lifelines. And Diane had this little game, right? Like, you know, if somebody new of color came in, we're, hey, hey, did you see it? See that person got hired, and we would like run. You know, the, the four of us would, would run to their office and be like, "Let's go to lunch. We have a lot to talk about." Um, and the strategy, I think that what our equity is about, it's really about putting practices in place, tools, and strategies, um, because we cannot do this alone. One, two, we need to know real, you know, real practical strategies, community organizing strategies that obviously Diane had. In, you know, ingrained in her from the teatro and also just who she is. 
Um, so I learn by watching, but I also learn uh, by taking trainings. You know, I, I highly recommend, you know, in the Latin community, we all need an anti-Blackness training. Uh, we all need to educate ourselves, to continually educate ourselves and grow and expand and excavate our racial identity um, as it relates to a larger, you know, societal conversation. And so I was very fortunate to be part of the first um, group that started, you know, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color surviving predominantly white institutions, which was a, a series that actually started right after Diane passed. And I remember being so in such an emotional state from some of the advocacy work I was doing in the larger field at that time in the wake of George Floyd's murder that I didn't know if I could do it. And then I, you know, I, I called on my ancestors, I called on Diane and she was like, you better do it because we need to advocate for that kind of collective strategy. And so I think that's also part of what I um, am putting into practice with our equity is really about Yes, facilitating conversations, opening space for people to have um, brave and safe conversations about these type of things, but also to say, you actually don't need to be in a space that's harmful. You actually don't need <laughs> to be in a, in a space that um, is actively causing harm, you know, and actively not working um, on bettering themselves. And so, and that was something I had, you know, a lesson I had to learn the hard way. And also, I think what um, I will say also about access is um, this idea that JD was talking about following and leading. So when I had Diane with me, I you know I can say I, I followed her for the most part. I mean, yes, we strategized, we whispered, we we had our really hideous couch that everybody <laughs> sat on that was broken, um, and we had our little strategy sessions there. But when she was left Center Theater Group, you know, before she passed, and then um, after. I had I had to move into a, a leadership space because it was a void. And I think um, she knew that I knew that uh, well, folks around us knew that. And I think it was um, something that I still am very proud that I did. Um, and I am continuing to say, OK, what where is my voice needed and where um, can I still follow? You know, so I think it's both end. And, and I think I also need to just um, it was a lesson that I had to learn where Actually, I can offer something into the conversation. I don't always have to follow, but then there's times where maybe I do need to to follow and um and introduce a new voice and introduce a a, a new generation as well into into these jobs into these conversations. So, I continue to work with our equity. I think they're an amazing resource. Um, we also have um, a Black Indigenous People of Color Leadership Circle that is going on um, the next cycle soon. And I highly recommend folks, if you are in a leadership position at a white institution, a culturally specific institution, and you just need that support, Chantal was a fellow. Um, and uh, we just want to provide support, strategy, a network. Um, that's another program that I highly recommend folks check out uh, that I, I'm on the facilitation team for as well. Thanks so much. It's so beautiful to hear you both sort of talk about um, your careers and just how sort of rich and diverse the, your experiences have been on both coasts, right? Um, and and I really it really warms my heart hearing how much connection happened at at the Encuentro in 2014, and knowing that sort of every festival or every sort of coming together where artists are at, like it's this there are these magical moments. Um, and places where we plant a seed that blooms sort of later and connections um, with one another. And so I've, I'm also noting that we're talking many of uh, both of you have used the term right. Diane is and because for she's still so present um, for for all of us and in the field. Um, and I just I really it, it's a better world, you know, acknowledging that her spirit is still with us. Um, it's just in a different plane. You know, it's it's helpful, I think, with the grief, um, but also we can see it in each other's work and each other's faces. And I think she would be so proud um, of both of you and so proud to know that um, that we're working to acknowledge artists in our field. Um, and in particular, you know, one of the things that Diane was so passionate about, as we saw in this great clip from Latin's Anonymous, um, was really acknowledging um, what the industry is like and what the field is like for uh, Chicanos, Latinos, right, Latine, Latinx communities. Uh, the terminology has changed, and and we've gotten more nuanced about our identities. 
um, and how we talk about them. But I think Diane's work shows um, how some of these issues have not changed, right? It's uh, the, the clip that we saw was so funny because sadly, many of those stereotypes still exist. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm interested if you could both uh, talk a little bit about your work in particular um, with the, the Latine, Latinx community. Um, and, and so, for instance, Adriana, you know, your work with the Soul Project has been fantastic. Um, and, and the Soul Project also um, is connected to Diane by the work of, um, of Jacob Padron, right, another one of her mentees. Um, and so could you talk to us a little bit about your work with the Soul Project and how you see it um, connected to the impulse to really support diverse Latinx uh, representation and visibility in the performing arts? Yes. Um, so the Soul Project is a, a collective, right? And so we we have long conversations about this. Um, and when when there are opportunities to partner with a theater, especially when they're a primarily white institution, you know, we do have to have very hard and and, and uh, long conversations um, on whether uh, this is a theater we want to partner with. Uh, is this a one-time thing? Um, because we ask a lot of from our partners. We hope that uh, when we partner uh, with with a theater that this is not a one time thing um, that this is that this continues um, and also selecting the play or selecting um, the playwright what is you know what is it that we what are we saying right what are the stories that we're putting on stage it's it's so hard um, to get a play produced um, that we want to make sure um, that when we make those decisions you know. They have they have an effect, right? They have an impact. Um, so it's um, definitely something um, that we don't take lightly, um, and it's really hard because there's so much work, right? There's so much great work um, that needs to get produced, um, and as you know, the Soul Project is a very it's a very small uh, initiative. It's a it's a small collective. And so sometimes it's so frustrating, right? Because we want to be able to open so many doors and be and be able to, um, you know, we're constantly trying to think of like different avenues, you know, like with SoFest, um, we do the new play festival during the summer or like readings um, uh, this year. Or last year, we started a writer's retreat. Like, how can we take care of each other, right? How can we take care of the artists, but not just one time, you know, like uh, longevity, Right, because we go through so many stages in our career, um, and we all have different needs. Um, so it is, um, it is something that we don't take lightly, and we do. We're very intentional. We're really thoughtful uh, about things. We don't always get things right. <laughs> we always, uh, you know, I'm always learning things, and I'm always real, you know, acknowledging like, oh, that didn't work. Can't do that again. Um, and then there's moments where like, wow, that was really great. You know, how can, how can, how can we make that happen again? So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I want to build off yeah. that, you know, um, yeah, I love this idea of care, right? This idea of like community care and, um, yeah, I, Diane was always so great about like checking in, right? <laughs> like she would just call and be like, how are you doing? You know, how are you doing? We got to go to lunch. I haven't seen my wife. Like she was always wanting to go lunch with my wife, <laughs> which I appreciate. And, um, but I also think like, it, and I, even I'd be curious to hear your thoughts and Chantal, maybe you can chime in as well. I feel like it it's that end also being dedicated to the practice, right? Like as a collective and as the, the LTC and the work that she did with TCG and the NEA, it's also about accountability to one another as well. And I think that sometimes we don't do this good and <laughs> we don't do as well in that part, right? Like as a collective, we do rely on sometimes a singular leader or you know a, a few folks right to put in the the labor and I'm just curious about that because I know Diane was always teetering with that as well and I think that's really something for us to consider since this is a commons you know based conversation that 
um, you know, she had to carry a lot of that load, you know, for 24 years at CTG and also at TCG and also at NEA. And, you know, she had to be the, the one voice, the, you know, and how do we, with that community care lens, how do we also take care of uh, like that, how, hold each other accountable with grace and love, but also hold each other accountable. So I, I don't know. I'm just very curious what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> Yeah, I and I really appreciate you bringing this up because I remember being at a TCG conference with Diane. Uh, you know, we were just both there, and um, and I think we were doing like a, a leadership of color meeting. I got very heated. There were, you know, there was um, there were folks in the room that that you know were maybe not supposed to be there, and Diane really sort of acknowledged the moment and shared her piece, right? And, and she was not necessarily in agreement with the majority of the, the group um, at, at the time, but she really owned her voice and, and used it right to, to speak her mind, but also from a place of love of like, if I love you, then I need to show, I need to share with you what is wrong or how I feel. Like, you know, she was always so uh, direct and honest about the, whether it was like giving theater notes, like the artistic notes, or if it was more like institutional feedback or receiving the feedback. I mean, I think in her role, she probably also received a lot of uh, feedback, like critical, harsh feedback regarding institutions that she represented um, and had to do so with a lot of grace and then take take those notes on, right? Um, so I think the burden on onto the the singular sort of uh, leader is a model that we should move away from so that we're we're holding each other, like you said, with care, but also holding each other accountable. Um, and it's rare that you find someone who will who will sort of tell you the truth at any at any moment um, and give you that as a leader. And I wonder, Adriana, how you feel about this, especially working with a collective um, with the Soul Project. Yes. Um, and, and even if you are in a collective, you know, I like what you say, you said sometimes, um, and it just happens, right? Because um, for whatever reason, sometimes the labor does fall right on, on a mm -hmm. few, on a few um, folks, but um, uh, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I have these conversations a lot with, um, with my pal team. Um, and we are all, um we're all, we're all women. Um, and so we love talking about this because I feel like our experiences are, uh, I don't know, they're just, we, we have shared experiences um, uh, as, as uh, artists, right, who identify as female and, and how we navigate spaces where maybe we might be um, uh, the only woman in the room and how we're treated differently. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a great space for me to be able to have those conversations um, with them. And we talk a lot about also being caregivers, right? Whether you're taking care uh, of your parents or your grandparents, um, or you have kids, it's also another thing, right? Another um, additional uh, responsibility that one has. Um, and how does one not burn out, right? Because there's just so much coming at you. Um, feedback and criticism, um, and then also navigating, like I said, certain spaces. Um, um, and so the summit that we're doing this December addresses that, right? How how do we take care of ourselves? Um, and having, you know, conversations about that, what are the tools that we need? Um, and, and also how to show examples of spaces that do work, right? Because it's easy to talk about Okay, you know this doesn't work, or the, but okay, how about how about how about this team or this collective? They're doing a great job, and like those things are, are working. So how can we bring that um, into into our um, into our space? Um, and we 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 we're living in a time right when it's easier to know what other people are doing. We're we don't we're not in a silo. Um, like I love that we've had so many. Uh, we brought up so many people. We're East West Coast. Right. And so in the past, it would have been like, oh, you know, there's not a lot of conversations, you know, and now, you know, there is it's just so much easier to know what's happening all over the world, not just in this country mm -hmm. and, and, and seeing like, oh, it, that's being done over there. Why? Why? Why are we accepting 
that the, the way things are here, you know, and asking for more stuff, um, demanding um, that that um, that the quality of life needs to be better. Um, and so I am seeing, you know, things um, changing a little bit, uh, bit by bit, but definitely care, burnout, making sure um, to take breaks and then having, um, you know, having people support you. You know, it's really, it's really hard, um, but you need to uh, find a way to build that um, and to have backup plans. You know, you can't, want, you can't carry everything. Um, and so uh, hearing about the program that you were talking about, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't know that program existed. I love that because sometimes you just need to talk about it and you need to talk about with other people. And then that way you can say like, oh, okay, great. How did you handle that? Wonderful. I, because I, I'm, st I'm constantly learning. Diane was so direct and so good at, at just saying the way it is. And I, I'm still I'm still not there. You know, I, I've had to learn. Um, I think I'm a more, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a great listener, but sometimes I don't know how to, um, um, I don't know how to say things, you know, and, and, and like, I don't have the vocabulary. And so hearing Chantal, hearing you, like I'm always learning. Um, and that's, that's what it's about, right? Learning from each other. I think mm -hmm. that that's one of the things the mentor mentee relationship is something that has been missing, at least when I started out. And I think that we're slowly each year starting to build that. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And and I think the mentor mentee relationship that that Diane had with others, and I and I think the relationship in particular with Patricia was, it seemed like, you know, you had an intergenerational sort of mentor mentee relationship where there might have been some slippage because I, I assume that Diane learned a lot from, you know, maybe sometimes you were the mentor um, to her in terms of accessing or thinking about different kinds of art or, you know, we're just from different generations. Um, and so I, uh, I have a, you know, a couple gems from Diane that, that I hold on to and I'd love to know Patricia, like, are there any gems of wisdom or a joke or some like a phrase or something that sort of it becomes an anchor in your work when you think about Diane or um, just wondering, you know, any little gems from your time with Diane that have become um, an anchor as you as you go through your career? Oh, my gosh. I mean, where where is my novel? You know, I mean, we need a Diane novel of quotes. Um, there's too many to count. But one in particular, I've come back to this piece of writing of hers um several times and um and it was for the world theater day it was like a speech she wrote for world theater day and i've i've quoted at this and then you know once uh with the current organization i'm in you know there's a lot of talk about vision i mean oh, what's the vision what's the what's the vision what's the vision and you know i i believe vision is, is collective and i also think vision is um something that grows and is informed right through an iterative process and it can't be, again, going back, it can't be one singular person saying, this is my vision. And then, you know, and, that, and I'm not trying to discount, you know, titles and such, but I've never really been interested in that game and agree to disagree. You know, I've had some criticism around that from friends and, you know, family, but for the most part, that's just my, my thing. Um, but something, I was sitting down with the current organization, LAPP, and I was like, okay, what is like something about Diane that has really inspired me? And with that World Theater Day speech, she talks about this idea of the non-commercial practices of theater and how we often you know, confine ourselves into a container, right? Of budgets, ticket sales. And not to say those things are not important. Of course they are. You have to keep those numbers around. But the fact that they really rule us on and off stage and that we're really obsessed. <laughs> she uses the word obsession, which I think is really powerful um, with tickets. <laughs> we're really obsessed with money, <laughs> but we're not obsessed with this thought of, our community, right? That we actually can activate the community around us as creators, this idea of community as creators. And that to me has been my guiding principle, you know, and again, it can cross aesthetics. It can cross, and we're, we're not talking about, you know, community theater in the traditional, it's talking about the expansive definition of community theater 
and how we need to activate that creativity in everyone. And it's not just about the passive ticket buyer. It's about our art form, our, our actual practice, being in conversation and in community with those who want to see it, who want to be in it, who want to create it alongside you. And yes, some of those will be ticket buyers. Absolutely. But they still need to be engaged with as uh, creative beings. And so I think for me, that's really been the gem from that speech that has carried all of my vision, if you will, for anything I do. And so I really, um, that's my practice. I'm always listen to Adriana's point, listening, learning, and iteratively designing with folks and not for folks Mm, Um, that's mm -hmm. something that I think she has always taught me for sure that's wonderful and Adriana I know that you know you perhaps didn't have a a mentor mentee relationship um, but you've certainly been very close to a lot of folks right that were directly related to Diane and and even at a slight distance you you know that she was um, a, a large figure in 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 the theater um, and so I wonder, are there any sort of, you know, mentorship gems that you've heard in your career or that, that you use as an anchor as well that you find relate to these themes that we're talking about this evening or afternoon? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I know for Jake, I know for Jacob, Diane, uh, was a, um, a huge part of, um, uh, for for the soul project i know she was very proud of jacob and um and this and this initiative so it was very special for us um to acknowledge um diane um when we received the obis this year um you know she there there there's so many there's so many moments just from a distance from seeing her across the room that really uh, just landed with me just um it was strong presence com- uh, commanding um but also so generous there's been so many of my friends who and and I was actually encouraged to contact Diane because I was looking for like a mentor mentee relationship um but I was a little bit shy um and I was afraid to reach out um because sometimes um you know, when you're starting out on your green, that's how you feel. Um, but I had uh, a lot of friends that did reach out and she opened her home, you know, and she um, uh, uh, took uh, them under their wing. And so I learned through them. Um, uh, and so, um, and then something else that that I was thinking a lot about while both of you were talking about this, uh, when I did the National Association of um Latino arts and culture um, leadership program, I had never, no one had ever talked about, as an artist, you never think of yourself as an organization, you know, or as like a, you know, and so a a lot of um, the participants were both artists and also uh, institutions or companies. And so when we were looking at mission statements, um, and all those things, I was like, well, how does that apply to us? And that was when, for me, it was like, wow, as an artist, you do have to have um, a mission statement for yourself. Um, you do have to have a guiding star. Um, so having a North Star for yourself as an artist, um, that way you can always check in with yourself and see if you have steered away. Um, it's always you know, it's okay to check in and, and seeing if things change or your priorities change, but having that, um, and that is something that I saw uh, with Diane and with the Latino Theater Company, um, making your own art, making your own art and building your own community. I even see that with, um, you know, Pregones and Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. When I go see their shows and the audiences, it's not about like how you said tickets and shows and all that stuff. No, it's about la comunidad. You know, and uh, that's something that I um, have witnessed and uh, I understand now that I didn't understand before. Because when I graduated from Yale, it was you graduate, you work regional theater. I was working regional theater. That was what I knew. So I didn't know this. And so that's why it was so wide opening for me. Thank you. That's really beautiful. Um, 
So, you know, I want to I want to take us in another direction and and watch a little some some more of Diane's work. Um, you know, for so many of us, Diane continues to loom large as a transformative leader, which she certainly is and continues to be with her legacy. Um, and it's a source of pride for us that she was not only a multi-hyphenated artist and administrator, but in addition to co-founding Latins Anonymous, as JD mentioned, um, she also worked with the most notable Chicano theater collectives in the field. So naming only two is Teatro Campesino, as we've said, but also doing a lot of work with Culture Clash in their early years, as well as um, very recently um, before her passing, having directed at Pasadena Playhouse their work. Um, and so I, I would just love for us to look at Diane's comedic acting together and share some reflections. This is a clip um, from Culture Clash's television show. Culture Clash, I believe, had the first Chicano sketch comedy show on television in the 90s. Um, and so we're going to watch um, a clip called Cholo in the Well. So I'm going to ask my colleagues at HowlRound to please cue us up. This is Bob Oso reporting for CCN from a vacant lot here in East Los Angeles where a cholo is trapped in an abandoned well. Help! Excuse me, sir. Can you shed some light on the dramatic chain of event that led to this tragic incident? Oh, Simone, you see me? You're Bob Oso, huh, man? See you all the time. Go, Bobby, go, Bobby. Go and get me out of here. Yeah, yes. Mijo! Mijo, it's your mother! I brought you the newest edition of Lowrider magazine and, and your favorite pajamas, the ones with the little feet. <laughs> we have here what appears to be the mother. Um, this must be very tragic for you. Actually, no. It's really quiet around the house since Jaime Jr. got trapped in this horrible hole. Yes. My name is Mad Dog. You're making me look like a punk, jefita. <laughs> I'm trying to talk to this nice TV man who said something with his life. Do you think that Goldie Hawn could play me in the TV movie? I'll touch up my root. Excuse me. I just saw you on TV. Oh. And I have something for your son. Oh, bless you, me. A very touching moment here as a total stranger here comes here to lend his support. Oh, my. Remember me oh my. All right, thank you so much uh, to our friends at HowlRound. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Patricia and uh, Adriana to come back onto the screen. I think we need somebody from HowlRound to activate. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can we get some tech support to get our fabulous? Ah, there, there we, we go. go. Great. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, uh, you know, I, it's so funny because this video is from the 90s, um, and the 90s are not 10 years ago anymore, as I always think that they are. <laughs> um, but I wonder what reflections you have sort of looking at this now, and in particular sort of reflecting on Diane as a comedic actress. Um, it, you know, just what, what is coming up for you in, in viewing that piece now? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, just again, brilliant comedian, physical actress. I mean, for me, you know, what's so important about um, clips like this and Latin's Anonymous and having the archives, you know, and Chantal obviously wrote a beautiful book archiving Diane's uh, Latina uh, theater initiative time as well. Um, this idea of capturing um, the political nature of comedy and the way that satire can be utilized um, through uh, and kind of penetrate, you know, our conversations today. And so that's really Diane and Culture Clash and, and, and her colleagues and her peers. This is really the, the nature of their work. And to your point about coll collaboration, kind of second secondarily, uh, but, but still equally important. I mean, they have worked together, you know, Richard and Herbert and Rick and Diane um, for years, you know, and, the, and it's always about, you know, just like any friendship, you know, ups, downs, maybe they take some time apart, what have you. 
but we they know that we are anchored together, right? We're tethered together through a community. And so I think seeing her in their TV show and also directing their plays and, you know, doing things to and her, you know, I, we commissioned Richard and Roger Guinevere Smith when I was working with her. So it's like, it always is very cyclical in nature. And I feel like that's also part of it too, is that not only is she anchoring her, her artistic practice in politics and, and, uh, and specifically comedy and physical, physical acting, but also this idea of always kind of coming back to your roots, always coming back to like, lifting your community up. And I just love seeing them crossing all the time. Um, but I can never get enough of this clip. I think it's just, it's just <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> I had never seen this um, clip before and I absolutely loved it. Um, it. She's she's just so funny. You know, comedy is hard. Comedy, not everyone can do comedy. Um, and especially because... Um, you know, as a performer, you do have to have that vulnerability and, and you have to have that um, genuineness and that, uh, that honesty. Um, and, and, she, and she's just so talented and so funny. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I think that's something that, that we are missing today, you know, at, uh, as a, as a, if you're a performer, having a, a theater company, that you work with each other and then you grow with each other. And then the more and more shows you do with each other, you learn and you grow as an artist. And then you find also your voice and what's important for you and what it is, what it is that you want to say. Um, and I, I see that when I watch these clips, right. I, I see um, ensembles that have worked together, you know, and that continue to work together and, and, and grew with each other and made them and made each other better you know, it's not always perfect, right? Um, but uh, having that uh, is really great. And I wish we had more of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's a really great point. And, you know, I had the uh, privilege of, of working very closely for seven years with the Latino Theater Company. They're like my theater parents, um, my family. Um, but but there is a shorthand, right? And, and I think you can sort of see it in in the way that, that um, Diane sort of is part of the Culture Clash Ensemble there. Um, and as a director, how she supported ensemble making and worked with artists that she built vocabularies with. Um, and when I was reflecting on this clip just now, I remember a very, when I first met Diane, I was working on, on my PhD and she had donated her her material to an archive in the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA. And I wanted to interview her, um, you know, for a publication. And I was very early in graduate school and I came to interview her and I was very sort of you know, muy muy, and I thought I had all my thoughts together, and I asked her, like, very bluntly about if she could talk about, you know, the difficulties of being a woman in the Chicano theater movement, and I was, I was making all of these sort of feminist, like, assumptions, and Diane was a feminist, like, from, from her, you know, lived experience and the advocacy she did, but she really taught me something that day, because she gently held me accountable, and gently, you know, offered to me to look at the the campesinos work and to look at the early work um, and not sort of just assume that the women sort of, you know, didn't have access, but, but she taught me sort of how to find where the subversion was and where the strength was within sort of the, the time. And so in this case, I feel like this clip is so funny because not only is she like have like a total rubber face that, you know, she commits like that she was an actress who commits um which is so important but also in this role like this really satirical subversion of the long-suffering mother right which is a chicano theater and and performance media trope where mothers right you know are only ever like suffering or in service um and then this reversal where she's like well it's actually quite it's nice and quiet at home you know and like how they subvert and that the violence that the the gun violence that is you know we don't see um anyone die and in fact the, the reversal that they actually survived and you know how to find a more a deeper nuance in reading performance especially through a cultural lens and not to sort of make assumptions and really look for the ways that that the artists are making a commentary it's something that I so appreciated um and how she did so quite gently for me <laughs> much appreciated um and so um as we as we start to to wrap up um 
one thing that I remember a story um, that I'll share as I was as I was applying for the job here at Yale, I was very concerned not only about, you know, leaving Los Angeles, which is my home where my family is, but also my theatrical home. Um, and I asked Diane for support and advice in how to, um, you know, how to share with my with my my other mentor, Jose Luis, right, that I was going to need to leave. And she was super, super supportive. I got the job. And like, I don't know, a month after I had started the job, I was still super overwhelmed. She called me and she was like, so what's next for you? <laughs> Diane, I just got here. Like, can I take a moment? And she's like, you always need to be thinking about what's next. And I want to encourage you to do that. Um, and then like a year later, I was called her. I'm like, this is what's next. You know, and so like, I would love to, in honor of Diane, I would love to just invite you to dream about um, and just talk about with me sort of what's next for you in your career? Or what are some, you know, short term, long term goals? Is there anything you sort of want to help manifest in this space while we invoke Diane's spirit and relentlessness of asking us to think about what's next? I, what's next? That that's so. That's always such a big question. Um, um, I I find myself um, there are certain things that opportunities that might pop up and that will terrify me and scare me, and then I'll say, and then I feel like I have to do it, you know, um, uh, just to challenge myself. Um, so open, definitely open to uh, new opportunities where I'm I'm challenging myself, which includes um, directing. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Um, and something that I talk a lot about, which I think it's important to talk about, um, open, you know, like if anyone else is listening, you know, for me, again, I, I still have the same dream. I want to have a family. I want to have kids. I'm still trying to make that happen. Um, and to me, that's really important. So that is a, a goal of mine. Um, and there's, um, uh, so many ways to make that happen now, because there are just, a lot more options available mm -hmm. uh, to to women um, nowadays. So yeah, those are some of my things. That's great. I want to see you directing, um, <laughs> and we all want to be invited to all the family birthday parties. <laughs> yeah. um, Patricia, yeah. what's what's next for you? You've had a bunch of you know career moves in, in the last couple of years, and and what is something you're hoping for or dreaming about in the next stage? I guess I'll speak more broadly. I mean, I think what I, Diane and I were always interested in is like, where is theater going, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and pushing the form and to your point about forms and, and uh, characters and the lineage of uh, the theater legacy. I'm very interested. I'm very interested in disrupting what we think performance is, you know, and I think that we started that a little bit with our, our collaboration at Center Theater Group. And she's only lit the fire further now that I'm at Los Angeles performance practice, which really is a more broad contemporary performance organization working in multidisciplinary practices like dance and music and puppetry and to Adriana's point like you're I was like my first dance project I was like I don't this looks great you know <laughs> like I don't, but then you know you have to educate yourself you have to learn you have to you know dig in and oh it's it's building off this history okay this legacy and um and I see where it goes and I think that to me particularly where our field is right now I'm very interested in like the what's next of theater and performance yeah. And we need to, and I love a good structured play. I worked in dramaturgy for a long time, um, but I also love the mess of a nonlinear, immersive, wild thing that can't even be categorized. And I think we need more artists that is um, getting messy and challenging what the form is. So I would say that. And I would also say continuing to work towards, you know, that collective liberation together as a community. I'm really passionate about the conversations that have started um, that still need to get, you know, deeper. Um, so I feel like that's really important to me um, in terms of my own practice. And then, you know, I'm with Adriana. I mean, I think for me, um, I'm really reflective of where I put my time now and, you know, my wife and my family and my dog babies um, are actually so important to me. And I think, you know, I gave a lot of my life in my earlier career, a lot of late nights <laughs> um, and not to say that that's not worth it. And I, I encourage folks like you do you, you know, you, we have seasons of life. 
but I'm just in a, a phase now where I want to um, up my artistic practice more. You know, I want to write, not for theater, but just for myself. And I want to meditate more and I, I want to take care of my body. I want to move more. And I think those things take time. And so for me, that's really what's next for me is how do I prioritize myself and, and prioritize my health? and my own artistic practices, as well as continuing to do those kind of bigger field wide pushing uh, disruptions. Um, but Chantal, are you going to answer too? Yes, I will answer too. Thank you. There's some, somebody in the chat also wants to know. Oh, um, okay. Let's hear it. Say, well, I will say, you know, um, I always think of Diane and with, because she's the one who would tell, you know, kept pushing me. And, and I, Andre DeShields also, when he accepted his Tony, I think talked Come about, on. right? The, <laughs> The bottom of the, you know, once you reach the peak, you're just at the the next goal. Um, and and I had the pleasure of working with Andre De Shields here. So all of those voices, you know, when I think about what's next, I'm like Diane's on to something. Um, and I will say, so I've just begun my tenure as associate artistic director of Yale Rep. Uh, we're going to open our first show next week. Uh, wish you were here by Sanat Tusi. And I really feel Diane's spirit with me because I was really missing. Um, artistic producing, right? I've been administrator at the school for a long time. I'm teaching in dramaturgy, but I hadn't been overseeing and supporting like the making of live theater. Um, and so that's been really inspirational. And I'm really looking forward to diving into that um, even more. And one commitment I'd like to make is I want to explore international theater more and and the way that Diane, you know, she went to Poland like every every couple years yeah. with another colleague, John Rivera, who's a, a dear friend as well. And like, you know, she was so um, her artistic sensibility was honed by so much engagement. And like Patricia said, in so many different kinds of theater. Um, and it was just so I'd love to sort of I, I need to go to Chile. I need to go to Poland. And, and in this role. I, I would like to sort of move into that um, realm and really sort of stepping into my power um, and thinking about sort of the ground that Diane has laid for us and how we step into that power. So those are sort of two things, you know, I want to I want to do well in this position and program great work um, and support work being done in, in a in a humane and, and celebratory way. Um, and I just I want to sort of revel in in the work of artists. Um, and she continues to be an inspiration um, for me in that regard. So th I think this is a great place to just sort of pause our conversation. Um, I want to thank you both so much for this enriching dialogue just with two you know, folks that I really admire. But I have found uh, speaking about Diane is always just so heartwarming um, and helps with uh, the grief. I mean, I think, you know, I think many of us will long grief. Um, her absence, um, but she's present in the faces of our colleagues and, and in the work that we're seeing. Um, and so I just thank you for this time. And I want to um, invite Jacqueline uh, back to uh, the virtual stage so she can help us close out this beautiful yes. evening. And thank you, Chantal, for beautiful questions, beautiful conversation. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much for this rich conversation. It's really been wonderful. Congratulations again, um, Patricia and Adriana. Thank you, Chantal and Jose. I can't wait to hopefully gather us all in person soon and to see what's next for you all. Um, nominations for the 2024 Diane Rodriguez de Atrista Award will open in early 2024. And you can find more information about the award at latinxtheatercommons.com. Thank you all again. To end the night, we'll now get to listen to audio of Diane singing De Colores, accompanied by Danny Valdez on guitar and vocals. Que viva Diane Rodriguez. <laughs> 